Well, good afternoon. I'm Beth Stewart, Director of the Texas Oral Health Coalition, and would like to welcome you all to today's special webinar provided by the Texas A&M University School of Dentistry Dental Public Health Residency Program. Thank you, Beth, and a special thanks to the Tex Ops for hosting the trainees of the Texas Oral Texas Recruits and Retains Program. I want to give a shout out to Dr. Bruno Ruess, who is the director of Texas A&M College of Dentistry Summer Research Program. Dr. Ruess provided the structure to complete the projects we are presenting today. In 2018, the state of Texas received a Dental Public Health Workforce Grant from the Health Resources and Services Administration, HRSA, along with the State Public Health Dental Director, Dr. Rhonda Stokely, the three dental schools of UT Houston, whose PI is Dr. Anna Newman, UT San Antonio, whose PI is Professor Magda De La Torre, and Texas A&M, where I am the PI, are all collaborating. We have three goals. The first is to provide scholarships to dental and dental hygiene students who are interested in careers in public health. The second is to promote interprofessional education. And the third is to provide opportunities for students to complete projects on social determinants of health. As we know, Texas is the second largest state in area with a growing population that has increasing diversity. But in our education model, dental hygiene and dental school curriculums are packed. Too few oral health profession, professionals are receiving the proper training to address the community health and really complex health needs of vulnerable population. Since 2000, um, when the Surgeon General's report on oral health elaborated on the great progress that we've made as a, as a nation, it did remark that all Americans are not achieving the same degree of oral health. We know a lot of the reasons due to that. Um, has to do with social, social determinants of health. In public health, we aim to promote health equity. Through these research experiences, we wanted our students to appreciate the importance of the social determinants of health, such as income, housing, education, racism, and any ways that could promote community oral health. So we charged our students you know, to use their creativity. During the current situation, our summer program had to go online and everything had to be remote. We told the students, basically, you need to address these two broad questions. Um, the first question in Texas, we really want to know, are there models to improve dental public health? And the second question, we know as dental professionals, we're you know really learning the, the, the top, the state of the art of quality dental care, but we wanted to know other than quality dental care, what else can oral health professionals do? With that brief introduction, I'm happy to mute myself. I, I know there's background noise, so that's why I keep going louder. Um, the first student we have today is Andrea Carzales. Andrea? Hello. <laughs> All right, so can I go ahead and share my screen now? Okay. Yes, please. All right, hello. <laughs> my name is Andrea Carrizales. And uh, for my project this summer, I looked into how COVID has impacted uh, dental practice among uh, the states here in the United States. So uh, my title is a state's response to COVID-19 in the dental setting. And I was mentored by Dr. Aneta Bituni. All right. 
So COVID-19 and dentistry, why is it important? So as you know, many dental offices and clinics stopped operations early this spring, and the ADA recommended ceasing all but emergency procedures in March 16, 2020. So there was the good thing, the upside was uh, that we were able to protect dental practitioners and patients. Uh, since the nature of the job is very intimate, by ceasing operations, the dental providers uh, were able to avoid making their offices a hub for incubation and dissemination of the COVID-19 virus. However, the downside was that the dental closings really affected access to dental care, especially uh, by canceling routine checkups that make, make it harder uh, and less likely for patients to receive effective preventative care. And some of the patients who are you know, the most vulnerable, they do not return or may not return, uh, you know, on time to actually diagnose uh, in a timely manner. These circumstances led us to an ethical concern. How do we reopen or what if, if, if we reopen without the proper PPE and knowledge or in any way that may compromise the health of the dental providers and the patients? So knowing that national organizations provided guidelines for dental practice during COVID-19, I wanted to really take a look into how states handle this information. So my research question was, to what extent do individual states follow national guidelines in the dental setting? In order to analyze this, I first identified and compiled COVID-19 mandates on closing and reopening dental practices as issued by the Department of Health, Dental Board, and Dental Association of the States. Then I researched national guidelines provided by the ADA, CDC, and OSHA for providing dental care during the pandemic, and I identified some key items. Then I evaluated states' recommendations and abidance by national guidelines to these items. And finally, uh, I analyzed the state's abidance by geographic U U.S. region and by political af um, party affiliation of states' governors. So for my results, uh, first I found Oh, sorry. First, I found that 42 states provided uh, guidance for dental practice during COVID. Um, the CDC recommendations were the most popular to follow. As you can see, 95% of the states that did provide guidelines uh, were following the CDC uh, recommendations. Then the 69 and 60% cited ADA and OSHA guidelines, respectively. Um, as you can see on the bottom, you can uh, I grouped similar items into six main categories. That was pre-appointment guidelines with four items, which included pre-appointment screening and continuing to use teledentistry whenever possible. 93% of the states um, had some guidelines, maybe not all of them, not all four items, but at least one of the items were cited in their guidelines. So we consider that uh, state to have some sort of pre-appointment guideline. Then uh, office readiness, 100% of the states uh, had some uh, language that provided guidance as for office readiness. Uh, this included some uh, waiting outside, in-office screening for patients and staff, and limiting comp companions, as well as requiring for uh, staff and patients to wear a mask whenever they were coming in. Then you can see procedure guidelines, five items, uh, which included minimizing aerosol generating tools and procedures and using dental dams and HVE whenever necessary. And 83% of the states uh, had some sort of language for these guidelines. Then post appointment procedures, which encompass asking patients to report uh, any COVID-19 symptoms if within two days of dental care by CDC recommendations or within 14 days of dental care by ADA recommendations. As you can see, only 38% of the states had some sort of language that asked for the providers to ask their patients to really keep them informed. Um, also PPE guidelines, 10% or 10 items. So we had a 98% of the states uh, which uh, had some language about this one. And it um, included allowing use of KN95 respirators rather than just N95. Also wearing eye protection, gowns, long sleeves, and prioritizing urgent care if PPE is slow. Other guidelines, uh, we considered six items, which included hand, um, hand etiquette, hand washing etiquette, as well as HVAC and ventilation recommendations, and 81% of the states uh, had some sort of guidelines on this. 
So our results, um, we did the chi-squares and there was no significant association uh, found in by geographical US region and abidance to each of the category um, of the national guidelines. However, there was a statistically significant association between the state's governor political party affiliation and abidance to pre-appointment, as you can see here, and also the PPE guidelines. So as you can see, uh, Republican-led um, states, they had a low um, pre-appointment guidelines abidance versus the Democratic, which had a higher one. And in PPE guidelines, uh, the Republican had a higher uh, abidance by the PPE guidelines versus the Democrats. So conclusions, although most states have offered guidance for dental practice during the COVID-19 pandemic, suggested recommendations by national organizations have not been followed completely. These discrepancies may create confusion among dental providers, and therefore it is suggested that in order to improve access to dental care at present and in case of future pandemics or national emergencies, uh, collaboration between states and national organizations to develop cohesive guidelines should occur. Moreover, states should really set up a system to track dental provider compliance with the guidelines. It is not uh, enough to just put the guidelines out and hope that dental providers follow them. We should be able to track how they're doing and adjust maybe on the guidelines themselves or try to help out in some way. Uh, further evaluation of ease of guidelines adoption from the dental provider's perspective and effectiveness of guidelines in respect to access to care and provider patient safety is needed. And thank you so much. <laughs> thank you, Andrea. Our next presenter is Jordan Chen. Hi, everyone. Can you guys hear me? Just want to make sure my volume is working. Yes, we can hear you fine. Okay, perfect. Okay. Ooh. Sorry. Okay. Hi, everyone. My name is Jordan Chen. I am a D1 student at Texas A&M College of Dentistry. My research project was on evaluating adult dental Medicaid during COVID-19. And throughout this project, I was mentored by Dr. Miranda. So just a brief background on Medicaid, it is a federal and state program that provides health insurance to eligible low income indi individuals in the US. And this program is administered by the state and they have the discretion as to what services are provided. So states are required to provide dental benefits to children covered under Medicaid and CHIP. But when it comes to adult dental care, that is an optional coverage and left up to the state. And as many of you know, COVID-19 is a novel strain of coronavirus disease that was first identified in 2019 and it has had a devastating impact in the US. So the main goal of my project was to evaluate the coverage of state Medicaid programs and their policies, any changes that were implemented by states during the COVID-19 pandemic, as well as offer recommendations to help improve adult dental Medicaid. Initially, Dr. Miranda provided me with a list of 11 questions or topics asking about each state's emergency coverage, dental benefits, per person spending, and more, uh, as well as um, any changes in teledentistry or PPE reimbursement during the COVID-19 pandemic. Because of time, I will be only covering a few of these topics during this presentation. So the process I went about collecting this information was contacting each state department browsing state websites and their COVID updates, util utilizing resources from the Oral Health Progress and Equity Network. And essentially I created a descriptive analysis with these statistics of each state's Medicaid policies and recorded the changes they made during the pandemic in an Excel sheet. So these were some of the results I collected from the initial questions regarding state Medicaid policies. And in these instances, I was collecting information on whether states covered emergency dental care or if they cover non-emergent dental services. And as you can see, 48 states said that they cover some form of emergency dental services and 35 states said they covered more than that, which Dr. Miranda and I classified as a combination of diagnostic, preventive and restorative services. No info in NA just meant that there wasn't enough information for me to go off of or it wasn't clearly stated or that the category was just non-applicable to the state. 
I also try to find out how many states had a maximum per person spending on dental benefits. So if there was like a monetary limit for dental services that they could receive. And at least 14 states did provide a spending limit. And out of those 14 states, 10 of them provided a minimum of at least $1,000. As this topic pertains to COVID-19, we wanted to find out if there were any changes to Medicaid during the pandemic. One of the most significant finds was that there was this increase in interest about teledentistry and telehealth. In general, states have broad flexibility to cover telehealth and teledentistry through Medicaid. And I was only able to find that prior to COVID-19, 13 states had specifically mentioned that they cover teledentistry. Half of the states didn't really have any information on it. But during the COVID-19 public health emergency, 38 states specifically updated their policy to allow this coverage. So you can see that there was this huge jump in teledentistry coverage due to states that expanded on it or were just temporarily offering the service during the declared public health emergency. I also wanted to find out whether PPE reimbursement was available for Medicaid providers due to COVID-19. And similar to teledentistry, states have the flexibility to adjust reimbursing providers for PPE. This means that states may add on a service rate for PPE costs or increase Medicaid services service payment rates to recognize those um, increases in PPE costs. But again, this is left up to the state to decide. I was only able to find that four states offered this reimbursement, 39 states did not. But out of those 39 states, five of them said that they provided some other form of cost coverage rather than just directly reimbursing for PPE. So they were trying to provide assistance in some form. Having said this, during the COVID-19 pandemic, there were visible changes that many states implemented to help Medicaid dental providers and their members to obtain the necessary services. Mostly you can see this through teledentistry. During this pandemic, more states have implemented teledentistry compared to teledentistry implementation pre-COVID. Although a lack of PPE and reimbursements show that there still needs to be a conversation held about increasing rates for dentists and encouraging encouraging them to treat adults on Medicaid during a pandemic. What has happened these last eight months and the state response to this pandemic is a reference for future emergency situations, but there's still more to be done. Some states remain unchanged for their Medicaid policies during the public health emergency. For example, in Texas, um, Medicaid, of course, for, dental, uh, for adults are limited to emergencies only. And during the public health emergency, there was nothing said about increasing teledentistry or reimbursing dentists for PPE. And as we live in Texas and as healthcare advocates, we need to look towards states that provide more comprehensive dental services, see what they have offered during the pandemic, as well as what they have offered in their Medicaid policies, and hopefully change what we have not only in Texas, but also in other states lacking those basic dental services. I do want to end with what are hopefully recommendations that must be considered when improving adult dental Medicaid. Assisting Medicaid providers is important during a pandemic. You can see this with the CARES Act Provider Relief Fund, which has provided roughly 15 billion to eligible Medicaid providers back in June and is still being updated. So continuous federal assistance through funding during this period is needed. For adults who rely on Medicaid and weren't able to receive care during the pandemic, States should look into teledentistry, expanding it, investing in telehealth, telehealth technology, as this has opened a new door for patient care. Most importantly, for individuals with underlying chronic conditions, getting that necessary dental attention is of high importance, not just under normal circumstances, but especially during a pandemic. And following the responses to COVID-19, states should allow for temporary policy changes in dealing with this current pandemic or any future pandemics, as well as in the case of natural disasters or national emergencies. So the responses or lack of responses from states dealing with COVID-19 not only highlights the importance of maintaining and delivering dental care during a pandemic, but also the need for a more comprehensive adult med dental Medicaid program that can, that can provide more than just emergency services. Thank you. Thank you, Jordan. 
Our next presenter is Ayang Jo. Hi everyone, let me share my screen. Okay. So hi everyone, um, my name is Ayong Jo and I'm a first year student. And um, my, my mentor was Dr. Timothy and we studied the association between socioeconomic level and nutritional guideline adherence in Texas schools. And our phrase was where you live matters. And hopefully you will find out about the meaning behind this phrase as I continue to explain my project. So my topic was about school nutrition. And when you first hear those words, oral health might not be the first thing you think of, but as you all know, uh, there is so much research out there showing the strong relationship between diet and oral health. So we already know that diet plays a very big role in oral health and of course our overall well-being. And considering this is very important, especially when we're talking about kids who um, like to consume things like candy and other unhealthy food. And plus kids don't really have a lot of say in what they eat because they're given food by their parents and the school. And so I wanted to explore what are the standards and guidelines that Texas school districts follow for their school lunches because they're going to vary from neighborhood to neighborhood and by economic levels. And this relates to our conversation about uh, social determinants of health. And I wanted to do this by looking at nutrition website, nutrition department websites of school districts all across Texas to see if these kinds of information were available for parents to see because parents are, you know, sending their kids off to school with their lunch money. They're basically trusting the school to provide their kids with good quality food. So my research question was, is there an association between school district's income level and its adherence to nutritional guidelines? And my hypothesis was school districts in more affluent areas will follow stricter nutrition guidelines and have a greater amount of relevant information available for parents to see. So I wanted to give some context and relevant information before I talk about the results. So I chose a random sample of 280 school districts out of 1,027, and that was done using a random sample formula at a 95% confidence level. And I made sure that rural areas as well as urban districts were well represented so that there isn't a bias among the geographic type. And I got the ge geographic type information from Texas Education Agency. And because there wasn't a set list or literature out there that explicitly stated, explicitly stated these are the guidelines that all Texas school districts have to follow. I had to do some research to come up with my own checklist and these were the items on the checklist. So first, does the school district say that it follows the national guideline for school nutrition set by the USDA? And do they say that they follow the Healthy and Hunger-Free Kids Act of 2010? And does the school district say that it follows the Smart Snacks in School guideline? And has the school district made available its wellness policy? And for those that don't know, the wellness policy is just like a written document that school districts write up to talk about their efforts to promote student um, well-being. And so I wanted to see if that was available for parents to see online. And lastly, does the school district have a program to make more fresh or locally grown produce available to their students. And this was to see if this district was going above and beyond to provide even healthier food for their students. And for the purposes of this study, if a school district answered yes to three or more of these questions, then it was, met, it was set to meet the study standard. So now here is the general statistics about each of the items on the checklist. So as you can see, all of the districts mentioned, all the districts mentioned in their um, nutritional web website, website that they follow and exceed the USDA guidelines, which is a good thing because that's more like a federal regulation that they have to follow rather than an optional guideline. As for the Healthy and Hunger-Free Kids Act, about a quarter of the school district specifically mentioned this while the rest did not. The smart snacks were mentioned by a little bit more than half, 57% of the districts, compared to 42.9% that didn't. Um, and 85.7% of the districts had their wellness policy available on their website for parents to view. 
and only about 18%, 17.9% of the districts mentioned that they are participating in some kind of program that lets the students have better access to fresh produce. And lastly, um, as I mentioned earlier, the nutritional standard for this study was meeting three of five of these guidelines. And 183 school districts, which came out to be 65.4%, met the study guidelines or study standards, while 34.6% did not. And here's some results about the association, since we wanted to take a look at what factors might be responsible for the differences that we saw. And I hypothesized that it was going to be the income level. Um, for the association between nutritional guideline and the guideline adherence and income level, um, although the results seem to show a correlation when we did the chi-square test, we found out that there was not a statistical significance in the relationship. Um, but there was a statistical significance um, association between nutritional guideline adherence and the geographic type, more specifically, whether the district was located in city and suburban area versus town and rural area. So to be uh, more specific, there was a higher proportion of the districts located in city and suburban area that met the study standards compared to those that didn't, and a higher proportion of districts in town and rural areas did not meet the standards compared to those that, those that did. And here's just a map of um, tech from the Texas Education Agency that shows the distribution of those districts that I was talking about, um, colored by the geographic type. So the shades of red and gray districts are the ones that are located in city and suburban, while the blue bluish districts are town and rural districts. So for my conclusion, my hypothesis, obviously, of uh, school districts in more affluent areas uh, following stricter nutrition guidelines and having more information on their website was not supported by my analysis because there was no statistical significance there. But what we did find out is that the adherence to nutritional guidelines is not related to the income level. Rather, it's the geographic location that tells us more about the adherence to nutri nutrition guideline adherence, more specifically, whether the districts are in city and suburban versus town and rural. And based off of what I learned from my project, I came up with a couple of recommendations that I thought could be made. Uh, since we saw that geographic location was more of an important factor, I would recommend a targeted program asking what's going on in these uh, districts in town and rural areas. Why did they, why did a higher proportion of them not meet the study standards? Are the districts actually not following these guidelines or are they simply not updating their websites with relevant information because it's like a two part thing? And as for a more general and overall recommendation, I think it would be nice if there was a set list of guidelines for uh, school districts to follow or like an official checklist or evaluation form that could be used across the board. Because right now, each of the district seem to have their own checklist and their own uh, way of evaluating their school nutrition. So that was my quick summary of my project. And thank you all for listening. Thank you so much, Ayung. And our final presenter is Ryan Allo. All right, hello everybody. So my project was increasing access to dental care for children with special health care needs, a TAMCO curriculum review and my mentor, Dr. Timothy. Okay, so first, children with special health care needs is defined as children or adolescents that have or are at increased risk for chronic physical, developmental, behavioral, or emotional conditions, and who also require health and related services of a type or amount beyond that required by children generally. So basically, it's children that have any extra needs. Um, and the issue that we looked at here was that dental care is the most frequently cited unmet need for these children. And there are several reasons to this, but one of them is that there is a lack of general practitioners that are willing to provide services. And, and as we looked into different research, one of the big reasons is because there's a lack of current um, relevant dental education while dental students are in dental school. So we decided to look at our school and see how we kind of stack up. 
So the way I went about this project was to look at the syllabi that we had at our school and see how many lectures are taught on these subjects. So we looked at lectures that mention children with special health care needs, developmental disabilities, and human developmental processes or biological disorders. Uh, we excluded any lectures that were about geriatric care or adult-only conditions um, because we were focused on children and adolescents. And then we took a strict definition as well so that we made sure we weren't um, over inflating our, our numbers. And the strict definition looked at lectures where the main topic was treating children with special health care needs. And then I took that strict definition and used um, dental facial trauma as a comparison. The reason that this was used as a comparison was because the prevalence of dental facial trauma in children and adolescents is about equal to that of children with special health care needs. Then we also looked at clock hours for pediatric instruction. Um, the clock hours were counted separately for didactic and clinical, and clock hours was counted as a subset of the pediatric didactic instruction. And the total clock hours for the DDS program was taken from a previous ADA study that calculated the average clock hours per DDS program. So looking at our results, um, there were a total of 54 syllabi that were reviewed, and there were less lectures on children with special health care needs than there was for the comparison in dental facial trauma. And when we look at, so when we take out these modules that were that we counted as lectures initially in one of the classes, there was half as many lectures on children with special health care needs and about dental facial trauma, even though, as we noted before, the prevalence is about equal. And then also looking at the chart, we can see that most of the education on these subjects comes in the latter half of our DDS program. And then looking at the clock hours, so there's only a total of 71 hours dedicated to pediatric didactic instruction. But out of the 71 hours, only a mere six are dedicated to learning about children with special health care needs. There are about 216 hours dedicated to pediatric clinical instruction, but none of this is um, dedicated directly to children with special health care needs. There is, however, an observational rotation that's available for students, but was not included in the clock hours because it is a um, is not required. So in conclusion, our current curriculum is very limited on learning about treating children with special health care needs. We need an increase in didactic as well as clinical instruction to be able to produce providers who are comfortable treating this population. Ideally, students would receive education earlier within the DDS program, because as we noted before, most of the instruction comes in the D3 and D4 years. So the recommendations that we made were that clinical rotations would be added to the D3 and D4 years. We could incorporate a D3 rotation where students can go to Children's or Scottish Rite Hospital here and shadow pediatric residents or faculty while they treat children with special health care needs. And then in the D4 year, incorporate two rotations where students can treat mild special needs patients. This would give the students an opportunity to see these patients being treated and then treat them themselves while they're in dental school so that hopefully they will be more comfortable when they come out and treating these patients. Another recommendation that we had was to expand the D2, D3, and D4 lectures to include the most common special health care needs conditions. This includes cerebral palsy, muscular dystrophy, ADD, and ADHD and behavior management. And then these would be tested by um, OSCE examinations, which have been shown to be good for helping um, learn about clinical relevance and cl clinically treating patients. And then we also suggested that there would be an evaluation of our pediatric lecture rotations to see how they can be restructured to an allow for a focused rotation on children with special health care needs. And considering that we just renovated our curriculum here at TAMCOD, we tried to make these recommendations in a way that could be efficiently incorporated, efficiently incorporated, um, utilizing special health care needs lectures that are already in our dental hygiene program. So the significance of this project. So in order to 
produce providers that are capable of treating these patients. We um, made a policy brief so that will hopefully inspire change in our curriculum to produce more dentists from TAMCA that are competent and capable in treating this population. And by doing this, this would increase the access to care for this population in Texas and beyond. And so that was the goal of this project. Thank you. Ryan, um, thanks everyone for listening so well. I'm going to turn it over to Beth so we can have um, comments and feedback from our um, great um, panelists. And um, for those participants who have questions, if you can, please put them in the Q&A and we'll get to those afterwards. Beth? All right, thank you, Dr. Timothy. Thank you. So uh, would you like to uh, start with the reactors one at a time? Do you wanna uh, just open it up to all of them or do you wanna focus on one, one speaker at a time? Um, let's try one person at a time so everyone gets a chance. We have about 20 minutes. Okay. So let's go to our reactors. Who would like to go first? Uh, Dr. Frey, are you prepared? You can see me. Is we my camera? You. We can hear you, but we can't see you. Okay. Well, I have my camera on, but I'm not sure. Okay, now I can start my video. Okay, Ryan, I thought that was a fantastic uh, summary of uh, how you as dental students are, are prepared to treat children with special health care needs. Uh, I do have a couple of questions and a couple of comments. One is that education is kind of like the first step. You know, if you introduce students to, the, to being able to treat a patient with cerebral palsy or Down syndrome or autism, they're a lot more comfortable. Research shows this. But I was just wondering from your perspective, um, what, and you know, we're looking at this as general dentists because you guys are dental students, not pediatric dentists yet. What do you see would be a barrier for a general dentist that graduates from dental school in 2021 and says, hey, I want to treat, uh, I want to treat children with special health care needs. Is there any limitations that you think of that could be like a social determinant of health or possibly um, maybe a financial barrier that would allow you to be paid to do the treatment? Did you look into that or have a sense of that? Um, not exactly, but I know that there's difficulties with, with insurance and things of that nature um, that make it more difficult to get compensated um, the way that practitioners would like to for you know taking the extra time that it takes to care for these patients. So I know that's also a factor that can kind of deter um, practitioners from dealing with that set, that set yeah. of patients. Well, my, my other comment and area was I really liked your comparison of uh, the hours and lectures that are focused on children with special health care needs compared to maybe um, uh, trauma, you know. So I think yeah. that uh, you know, the fact that they're both kind of occurring at the same percentages in a population, then you would hope that those would be kind of equal in, in a curriculum. So my, com my, my second question that relates to that is the American Dental Association uh, Commission on Dental Accreditation just changed standard 225 to reflect that graduates are to be competent, not just in assessing the treatment needs, but to manage them and to actually know when to treat and when to refer. Uh, how do you think that might impact uh, dental curriculum for maybe people who are first year dental students that, you know, for fourth years, you, it's already set, but we still get to work on curriculum right now. Do you have any ideas on that? Um, I think hopefully that that would increase the education that we give students on this, uh, on treatment's population, since it has now been made a requirement. So hopefully that they will, they will get more experience um, actually seeing these patients and getting maybe at least some hands-on or at least getting to observe people treating these uh, patients. I think that's a big thing because I know for me, I haven't really gotten to see anybody treat special health care needs children. And so even just being able to see it will make, you know, make students be more comfortable and maybe doing it themselves, at least for the mild special needs patient. 
All right. Well, that was fantastic. I thought you did a good job on the way you did it. And then my final comment is just back to Dr. Timothy. I think you guys did a fantastic job with your summer research. And I was very impressed with everybody. And just to the audience in general, uh, EPSDT mandates uh, benefits to children, but not but there's not a corollary for adult dental care. And so one of the biggest challenges with children with special health care needs is transition to adolescent and adult care primarily because what we're seeing in pediatric dentistry is it's an age limited specialty. And, you know, we still have a lot of great pediatric dentists that will treat people as adults, but some do not. So I would encourage people to get a little more familiar with the options in Medicaid because you can do the 1915 I option and you can provide a, a transitional uh, dental benefit to a specific population. It doesn't have to be statewide. And I think those Medicaid policy barriers are something that uh, as advocates, we need to have that discussion here in Texas, because I think unfortunately, we have a lot of people that as they age with uh, autism specifically and, and other developmental disabilities, they get less care. So we, we need to, as dentists, we need to advocate for that in addition to learning the technical aspects of being able to do a procedure. So there's kind of Advocacy, I think, is probably more valuable than the skill because you're going to apply your same dental skill that you learn in dental school to all patients. But advocacy is going to open the door so we can tell a young dentist, hey, you can make a living doing this. And, I, and lastly, Dr. Beth, I wanted to thank you and the Texas Oral Health Coalition for asking me to be a reactor. Thank you very much. Oh, well, thank you, Dr. Frey. We appreciate it. Excellent questions. Uh, let's go now to uh, Annalise Cothran. Annalise, do you have any questions for them? one of the presenters? Um, so I wanted to first uh, to thank TechSoc for uh, creating this um, opportunity. Um, and I think my immediate reaction to all of these um, presentations was how incredibly important and timely each one of these topics were. Um, not to say that I was surprised because I'm so used to the dental schools in Texas doing wonderful work and seeing all of the mentors um, with uh, who, who helped out each one of these students along with knowing the PIs um, of the grant. Um, I'm not surprised at the wonderful work, but um, to me, it immediately sort of triggered, um, you know, these topics are, are replicated nationally. Um, and so I, I think the work that, even though it was a summer project, I actually think all of this is incredibly important and applicable. Um, so thank you to TechSoc for amplifying it and thank you to the students for um, really investing in important topics that have direct application to um, populations that need our support right now, vulnerable and minoritized populations. Um, so whenever I was looking through um, each of the presentations, which everyone did such an amazing job, um, I know that there were some focuses on rural areas, um, but I also wanted to ask if there were any considerations, um, and maybe you couldn't present the data, um, but uh, were there any considerations moving through um, in terms of racial equity? Um, and how within each one of those policies, within sort of overlapping even with specialty care um, and mentioning, um, you know, uh, working with populations with special needs and how racism and racial inequity can amplify those issues that we see and those disparities that we see. I just kind of wanted to open that up to each one of the um, students to reflect and respond to that question. Was racial equity a consideration as you were going through your literature review? And if so, is there anything that you wanted to share particularly about that that you weren't able to talk about during your presentation? And if not, it's okay, we can skip over you. But um, if the students had any thoughts that they wanted to share about um, just weaving a racial equity through their presentation that they wanted to share out. Would anybody like to go first? I will say I didn't directly look at um, racial equity in my topic, but my preliminary research, I did see, you know, how lower income individuals um, who have special health care needs get less care, and that in turn can turn into racial disparity 
um, as far as you know lower income people being of different from different backgrounds. So I did see that in my preliminary research, but as far as um, my direct research, it was not in there. Thank you, Ron. Would anybody else like to address the question? Okay, that's that's fine. I appreciate that, Ryan. Um, and I think you're really sort of reacting to and responding to all of the pieces of the social determinants of health. Um, and so I think that's important to note, um, like issues like poverty and how that uh, continues to create systems that oppress people of color. And so I appreciate you bringing that up in your um, presentation. I did have one other follow-up question about nutritional, um, the nutritional guidance from um, adherence in Texas dental schools and where you live matters. I was wondering, um, I, I was working with a research group um, fairly recently, and we were talking about how um, nutritional exposure in our community, how exposure to sort of nutritional messaging can help influence um, what we, the nutritional choices that we make or have the opportunity to make. And on top of that, um, how oral health care providers in those communities can help reinforce nutritional messages. And so I wanted to know um, if you had thought about how specifically oral health care providers living in those communities that you saw differences in, how they may be able to directly engage in nutritional guidance. I didn't obviously study it during my um, research time, but I think that's a really good idea because um, I think I saw research out there that was showing like inter like pro, um, exposing the students to even just like exposure to healthier food and um, hiding the unhealthy options in the back or something like that had an influence on what um, the students like went towards and picked for their lunches. So I think exposure and education are both, you know, very integral parts of, you know, oral, oral health and nutrition that go hand in hand. Okay. Okay. Well, thank you, Annalise. We appreciate that. Let's go to our next reactor, uh, Dr. Keila Johnson. So thank you guys so much. I agree with everyone, what everyone has said before. Um, you know, each of the topics was very relevant. Um, two items that our agency is actually going to be supporting legislatively this year is uh, teledentistry and adult Medicaid. So um, I will ask a specific question of um, Jordan. Was there any specific data about why some of the states chose to cover adult dentistry and, and some didn't? When you did your research, did you locate anything that kind of discussed that in particular? So when I was um, looking up on each state's policies regarding teledentistry, um, a lot of them that just already had it before were including it um, well, they, they, a lot of states, like the states that had it prior to COVID already had it in their policies and they were just like expanding on it or adding a few other, um, let's say if it was just limited to like a limited oral, uh, oral procedure, they could expand on that. Um, and I think in, in regards to your question um, about whether, uh, sorry, well, uh, could, that was, do you I mind? was basically asking, did you come okay. across anything in particular? Was it you know, financial? Was it something where you felt like the state just believed more in the importance of oral health? Like I was trying to see if you came across anything that really guided some states choosing to have adult Medicaid coverage versus those that didn't. Um, I would say that, um, so as like a kind of like a side note on this project, we kind of looked at also um, the party lines along the states mm -hmm. and, you know, whether if it was a um, a liberal leaning state, whether they provided teledentistry coverage uh, prior to. And so um, I think a lot of it has to do with uh, the current, um, whoever's in the, the state seat at that point. And um, a lot of them with, I know I talked to individuals from states like um, Hawaii, who they were really trying to get teledentistry on, onto their next, um, session because due to like location and geography like that plays a big role in 
how teledentistry, teledentistry can be used. Um, but at that point, like when I was speaking to the individual from Hawaii, she said that it wasn't, um, teledentistry, teledentistry wasn't a coverage at that point. And so they wanted to do it. So I think a lot has to do with like geography um, as well as like the political party um, currently in um, holding the, the, the House and Senate. Okay. Um, yeah. I did, I wanted to ask just um, a quick follow-up question, but I know there's two more speakers. So if we have time at the end, I will, but you guys did an excellent job. Oh, thank you, Dr. Johnson. We hope to get back to you for that follow-up question. Uh, next is Dr. Josephine Wolf. Hi, everyone. You guys did such a great job. Um, Jordan, Ryan, Andrea, and, and Ayang. Deep breath. It's over. You guys did great. Um, I have a quick question just for the sake of time for um, Ayang. Um, so during your analysis, you ran the chi-square test, but we know that the, the chi-square test is extremely sensitive to population or sample size. Um, and the reason I bring that up is because in Texas, we know that the poverty rate in rural communities is 18% compared to urban areas being 14%. So I'm wondering what your thoughts are if your um, observation counts um, played into that because you did show that there was a significance for rural populations, um, which we know rural populations again have a higher level of poverty um, so do you think your observation counts played into that in any way? I think I could have factored more of that into it, but I, it's my first like research project doing analysis of this nature. So I think um, we were trying to keep the factors, you know, less complicated, if that makes sense. So we just looked at whether, like whether it was rural or not and the, whether it, um, if, uh, looking looking at the um, poverty level based on the, uh, the like the income level was measured by the uh, eligibility percentage of the um, eligibility of reduced and free lunch rate and I think I could have looked at other means of measuring the income level to um, get a more accurate um, this depiction of what like income levels are like um, among like uh, rural and urban areas. So that's something I could have factored into maybe in the future I can um, factor in more. Yeah, I loved the information though. I think even though um, there for this observation, there was no significance. I think clearly um, when you did identify that rural populations um, had a greater need that in, in a sense there, there was significance. So yeah, great job. Yeah. I was also kind of surprised that the income level was not significant, but it very well, like I said, could have been the measure um, of, for which I conducted the, uh, at, that I get gathered the income level like statistics. Yeah, and, and the test is just very sensitive to sample size as well. So yeah, great, great job. Well, thank you, Dr. Wolf. Uh, let's see, now we'll go to Dr. Uh, Ankit Sanguia, uh, THI. Hey, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I have some network connectivity issues, so I'm just staying on audio today and apologize for any inconvenience or background noises. Uh, great presentations. In the interest of time, I'll keep my comments short. One of my question on uh, medical expansion and political lines has already uh, answered. Uh, the only comment I would give for uh, for all of our student researchers uh, and on their excellent work is um, moving forward as you pursue uh, additional research in this space, uh, to always think about your research question from uh, the person center or from the individual perspective, as we really are trying to establish the link between social determinants of health and oral health, uh, which I think was well captured in your presentation, but probably wanted to see that as part of the background context in helping you identify your research question. Uh, could have really strengthened the narrative and that's just more of a takeaway uh, for your work moving forward but again excellent work and I think it has uh, several implications and value uh, especially during this time of the pandemic so thank you again for allowing me the opportunity to comment and um, uh, keep up the great work. All right well thank you Dr. Uh, Sangi. Uh, let's go back to Dr. Johnson real quick with her follow-up. And my follow-up question was for um, 
on, I'm hoping pronouncing it correctly, Andrea, my question was just, when you did some of your research about all of the protocols and different things that were adopted specifically because of COVID, did you come across any information that you feel like some dental practices and even some of the guidelines will become permanent once we are out of the pandemic? Um, so that's a really good question. And I do think that some of the guidelines could become a little bit more prevalent in how we practice dentistry, um, especially things like uh, maybe filling out a questionnaire before uh, meeting up with your doctor. That's something that many uh, offices already do just beforehand so that you don't even have to, you know, spend time uh, waiting in the office, but also it allows the doctor to get to know you a little bit earlier. And also, um, Maybe uh, the N95, um, I'm not entirely sure on how realistic it may be for uh, dentists to continue wearing N95s during procedures. However, we have seen in the past that uh, wearing masks uh, sometimes becomes more prevalent at a time of disease and that uh, PPE wearing, it just continues later on. So maybe uh, PPE uh, guidelines could change in the future for dental procedures as well. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm, thank you. Very good. And I see in the chat box or the Q&A box, um, someone had a question and Jordan Chen answered, responded uh, in the Q&A box. Thank you very much. Uh, so Dr. Uh, Timothy, I'll go ahead and turn it back over to you to close us out. Thank you all very much for your participation to all the reactors and the presenters today. Great, Beth, again, a big thank you. Um, I am just so happy that you know you, you coordinated with the Texas Oral Health Coalition and the reactors. Thank you so much for your feedback. It really helps, um, helps me as a faculty really understand um, what real life folks need. And we really need to work together to advance some of the challenges we have, you know, here in Texas. And I just look forward to having sessions like this again. This was just really a great opportunity. The students really appreciate it. And um, thank you. And again, just to finalize, the, the uh, recording for this webinar will be on the TechSoc website uh, first thing tomorrow morning. So please visit us there. The, the uh, URL was in the chat box but it's uh, techsoc.org, go to the education page and then find the um, recruit and retrains program and that's where you'll find it. So have a wonderful afternoon, everyone. And thank you all again for your participation. Thank you, bye-bye. <laughs>